Good evening. So um, anybody who's not seated yet, there's still one seat, two seats over here. And then the rest in the very plush Time Warner room you can, you're already familiar with upstairs. I'm super happy to see you all. Um, my name is Paola Antonelli, and I am the director of R&D here at MoMA. I like to say that it's a lot of R and very little D, uh, but that R really fills our day. And I would like to start today with something that is slightly awkward, but important, I think. Uh, I have just curated, together with a great team, the 22nd Triennale di Milano that's called Broken Nature, and it's about the idea of restorative design. It has very many connections with what we're talking about tonight. And together with a group of wonderful colleagues, amongst them, I don't know if Heather Davis is already here tonight, but with the Etienne Turpin, who has been working with her and several others, we decided to try and do, to start a public acknowledgement. The way, I don't know how many of you have been to Australia or in Canada, and at the beginning of any public speech, there's an acknowledgement of the people that were there before. It's something really moving and poignant. In Canada, it's not a law, but people do it. Um, we would like to do that for, uh, for the earth, you know, an acknowledgement of the world. And we would like to try and start it so that then it becomes almost endemic. And as you know very well, language changes our behaviors. So I'll just go and recite what we have written. And of course, I acknowledge and respect whoever was here before. When it comes to Manhattan, I went and checked today the Canarsie tribe of the Native Americans, and then some of the species that have become extinct, like the passenger pigeon that everybody knows very well, and all the species also that will come. But most important, with these words, I would like to pay my respects to the planet and to all the species that inhabit it, to celebrate the value of biodiversity and to remind ourselves of the responsibility we share to protect it. And these words are just a small reparative gesture, but hopefully a powerful one, because 
they're the first incomplete stage of a larger project that I hope will become endemic. And so with this, I, uh, I really welcome you all here tonight for the uh, salon, the R&D salon on plastics. Plastics, as several of you have already told me, it's an obsession for so many of us. An obsession for those who work on it, with it, but also very simply for those who live in this world because we have become really aware of plastics as a threat, plastics as an opportunity for better futures, and plastics also as a need to change the way we live so that in the future we will not encounter these fossils. You're looking here at Kelly Jasvac's plastic glomerates. Kelly, are you here? Yeah, there you are. So Kelly, the artist is here. Kelly Jasbach is also here. This is a beautiful project get, that Kelly uh, started together with a geologist and an oceanographer. And uh, they went to a, a beach in Hawaii where they found these actual uh, fossils that are not fossils yet. They're simply uh, plastic garbage that's been sent by the uh, currents in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that the Hawaii are at the center of, and that merged in the sand with the lava, volcanic lava, and become these amazing objects that could, might as well be, uh, fossils of the future. And these are on display at the 22nd Triennale, Broken Nature, in fact. But you know, plastics is extremely important. Plastics represented a lot of progress for the world, and it made many innovation possible, especially, for instance, in the medical industry. You know, they were uh, the beginning of, like, computers, cell phones, many life savings devices, and, of course, also so much great design, as, you, as we know very well. You know, we try to always keep uh, Samantha Ozer and I, Samantha does all the research and prepares all these wonderful salons. We try to stay away from design because this is R&D, not A and D. But still, when it comes to plastics, design is paramount. And you see here some of the amazing innovations from bumpers and telephones and uh, uh, really great toothbrushes to new airplanes that are made of composites to all sorts of 3D printed prostheses that are a very much lower prices and available all over the world. And of course, the great design fashion, of course, from salt and pepper all the way to Miyake, and then also great Italian and uh, Danish and American and uh, French design, and you can imagine how much more there could be. I remember when I was a child, there was a commercial in Italy that was talking already about plastics. It was pro-plastics and was saying, imagine the world without plastics, and people were falling from their chairs, and the computers were falling and breaking. Everything was falling apart. So plastics are at the core of our lives. Now, this is a dense, dense, dense slide, but I thought it was important because maybe you can take a quick picture or see it later in the R&D Salon's website. Uh, sometimes we don't know what kind of plastics are around and what kind of polymers are around. So glossary, plastics, everything that is bendable and moldable. Polymers, really large molecules that are composed of different submolecules and therefore are flexible and very resistant. Polymers can be natural, like natural rubber is a polymer or they can be completely synthetic. That's the molecules that we deal with the most. The ones that are synthetically obtained and that are so hard to break down and to recycle. But that said, all of these different uh, synthetic polymers have been invented at different moments in history, have had different impacts. They have lives of their own. And they're really fascinating. For a design buff like me, Plastics are a universe of delight and possibilities, horrid as they are for the environmental impact they carry. Uh, as I told you, there's a history. John Wesley Hyatt, the very first to mix nitrocellulose and camphor and create that uh, alternative to ivory for billiard balls that won him $10,000. There was a competition at the end of the 19th century by a company in New York, and he won it with this new uh, a material that was celluloid. And celluloid remained for quite a while. It was still a semi-synthetic, semi-natural polymer. The first completely synthetic polymer was bakelite, invented by Leo Bakeland in 1907 because he was looking for an alternative to shellac. Shellac is the natural resin that is produced by the female she of the lac beetle in, uh, in Asia. And it was an amazing insulant and the booming electrical 
uh, industry in the United States needed more and more and more of it. So Leo invented Bakelite for the electrical industry, but of course it proved so amazingly durable and so good at insulation and at so many different other properties that it first that it immediately got adopted for much more. And actually it became known as a great alternative to tortoise shell. So plastics were considered actually a way to save animals and to save the environment once upon a time. Other steps happened, especially in the 1950s and right after World War II, three in particular. Well, Wallace Carothers invented nylon in 1935, so before the war. But in 1953 and in 1954, a very short distance in time, Carl Ziegler and Giulio Natta invented one polyethylene and the other polypropylene, and they got the Nobel Prize for that. So these are the big changes, and polyethylene is the basis for all the plastic bags. That's the high-density one. So these are really the materials that we're dealing with so much in our lives. We don't see that much bakelite, but this is polyethylene, high-density polyethylene. Now, there's a Swedish company that at the beginning of the 60s um, developed a patent for this kind of tubular packaging materials. And one of their employees, I can't remember exactly the date, I'm going to tell you in a second. In 1965, team member Gustav Tulinstein had the idea of the t-shirt plastic bag and he also deposited a patent for it. So it was called the t-shirt plastic bag. Some others call it the bodega bag. There's a Mary Pink from Slow and Steady Wins the Race that does the bodega bag in many different materials. But so you see here, this has become the bane of our existence and uh, a very interesting catalyst for many, different, uh, for many different discussions. Because when it was introduced in the United States in the early 1970s, people still preferred paper. And the industry really lobbied and pushed to substitute in people's minds plastic to paper. So there was an effort, as very often happens, especially in this country because lobbying is so much more powerful here, to push consumers, another word that we might want to try not to use that much anymore, towards plastic instead of paper. Now, the um, the importance of plastic and the uh, consumption and production of plastics is enormous. The generation, the plastic generation, is at 50 million tons. And it's mostly in China. China is the biggest producer of plastic, but also the United States manufactures and produces its own plastic. So it's really a global issue. And it's a global issue also because plastic travels, especially plastic waste travels, as we'll see later on. And there are it's so really embedded in the way we live, in the way we sell, in the way we package, in the way we consume, that it's very hard to even think not to uh, deal with it. But the truth is that plastic waste is choking the world. You see here a few of the images that I'm sure you're all become familiar with, but that still, I hope, have not gotten to the point of anesthetizing us to the issue. And you see here the great garbage patch that uh, actually was given that name by, wait a second, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, you tell me, Kelly. It's Charles Moore. Yes, Charles Moore, thank you, the great oceanographer that actually Kelly works with. He gave it that name. It's one of the three big concentration of plastic waste in the world's oceans. So there's a, a lot of different statistics and a lot of diff different figures that are really um, scary and earth shattering that are related to plastics. And of course, plastics is for almost forever. So Charles Moore here, the marine researcher that we mentioned so much, shows a debris of microplastics from the Great Garbage Patch. So microplastics are even more insidious that plas than plastic debris because they're hard to see and they go to really infiltrate the smallest fauna and flora and, uh, and really choke the oceans. You see here also, I don't know if Chris Jordan is already here tonight, but the director of Albatross is here tonight. Um, and uh, we've seen so many pictures also of uh, birds and other mammals and uh, fish that eat plastic thinking that it's food and die because of it. Um, so 
the microplastic pollution and the macroplastic pollution is almost forever. You see that crate that was found also in the GPG, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It was produced in 1977 and it was found in 2019. So as you can see, it doesn't go anywhere. Now, recycling is really a challenge. I found this interesting um, notion in Samantha's research. Once upon a time, we were exporting all of our uh, plastic waste to China because of the trade imbalance that we had, that as you know is so much in the first pages of all newspapers. So because of the trade imbalance, ships would come to China filled with products to sell on the American market, and then they would be there, sitting there empty, so they would get filled with plastic waste that would go to China where it would get recycled and it would really be, um, it would be treated well and in very cheap ways. Now, because the trade imbalance was kind of uh, set more in balance, there was no more a need to fill this recycling, uh, to fill these ships with recycling. And so the recycling stopped, that flow stopped, and all of a sudden it's become much more costly to recycle. And the consequence has been that many cities in the United States have abandoned recycling altogether or have curbed certain types of plastic that are harder to recycle because it's become so, uh, so difficult. And actually there was a statement by uh, an airport officer from Minneapolis saying that they were keeping the garbage recycling bins to create the illusion and the spirit but that recycling was not really happening, which is stunning. But I think that for all of us that are obsessed with recycling, knowing that those things end up in landfills is not really something that makes us happy. So there are many different ways to recycle and reuse. So there are ways to sell bottles, like really sell the plastics, have it, been, have it be completely uh, separated and then recycled. That's one of the biggest problems, especially with uh, plastic bags. And actually the ban, the plastic ban, uh, plastic bags ban started in Bangladesh of all places in 2002 because the plastic bags were contributing to the flaws because they were, um, they were stopping and uh, all of the ways to drain the water. So there really are many different ways to recycle, but what's necessary is to select the different plastics and separate them. And one of the few places that's doing it is Recology, which, which is a big recycling plant in San Francisco, but there are not too many of them. Uh, there's also a way to use waste by burning it and having waste to energy plants that are very common, for instance, in Scandinavia. Uh, and of course, there's composting for some types of bags. So there are many different ways, but one of the most efficient ones is to uh, make people pay more for plastics. So as simple as that. How did we stop the smoking? By raising taxes on cigarettes, and the same can happen also with plastics. Um, design, of course, also takes care of some of the recycling. And it's funny because you see there a page from the catalog of my very first exhibition here at MoMA in 1995. Oh, yes, I've been here almost 26 years. And it was called Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design. And that's what recycled plastic used to look like. It was very confetti strained and it was not particularly elegant, but still people were trying. And you see here, other examples of designers dealing with recycling. Dirk van der Kooi on the left-hand side takes all the interiors of refrigerators and makes them into a slur that then is deposited like toothpaste by a robot and creates those beautiful chairs like the endless chair. On the right-hand side, Greg Lynn altogether took plastic toys and made furniture out of it in 2008. And then there are designers like Dave Hawkins that instead create uh, kind of home recycling plants that you can make objects out of. Designers are also thinking of alternatives to plastic, or at least plastic without oil. There used to be plastics also before oil. We talked about shellac, there were many other types. And at the bottom right side, Forma Fantasma actually did a research on pre-oil uh, resins together with a foundation that studies plastics to show people that you can still mix in your kitchen with fumes that are not necessarily that, uh, that benign, but still you can do it. You can mix resins and plastics by yourself. On the left-hand side is the algae platform of Atelier Luma. 
Algae, together with mushroom, are the heroes of the alternatives to plastics. And this Atelier Luma in Arles is developing a way to teach people all over the world to use their own algae. And as you know, algae are a byproduct of, of pollution, so there's plenty of them, to transform them into bioplastics that then can be 3D printed into objects that actually can be part of the local culture, because you've seen, you see there also work done in Istanbul and in Cairo with these algae plastics. And last but not least, as I mentioned to you, mushroom and mycelium, uh, especially when it comes to expanded polyurethane and the foam that's been used to package objects for, for a very long time, mushroom mycelium combined with stalks and uh, corn husks has become an alternative uh, for packaging and also for architecture. That is the uh, Hi-Fi by the Living that was the Young Architects Program winner in 2014 at MoMA PS1. So many possibilities and many uh, alternatives. And uh, tonight we're going to discuss with five wonderful speakers. And these five wonderful speakers will show us ma many different aspects of the issue, whether plastics are forever, whether all plastics are toxic, whether recycling is real, and what is the future of plastics in general. Um, we, you will meet them as we go, but Christina Agapakis uh, is a great old friend and wonderful biologist and artist that works with Ginkgo Bioworks, which is a company that tries to inject engineering with biology and create new materials for the future. And then we have Mark Chambers, who is with the, I, I'm always bad with titles, the sustainability expert, yeah, sustainability expert for the city of New York, for the mayor's office. So he will tell us a lot about what goes on behind the scenes in the city. Smack in the center is my dear friend Roger Griffith, who's a conservator here at MoMA, who's, been, who's seen so many of my tears over plastics objects from the 1960s that are falling apart in many spectacular ways. Then we have Marina Zerko, a great artist that just showed me these amazing books, like there's a manga book for recycling plastics that I can't wait to dive in. But artists, as always, are uh, a way for us to really talk about these serious issues here at the MoMA R&D Salons. And last but not least, Greg Bookfinder, who is the CEO of Emeco, a great furniture company that traditionally produced aluminum chairs, but starting about 10 years ago, uh, began using recycling polyethylene at first and then went on to create an almost perfectly circular uh, system. So uh, we, they will be accompanied by videos, as you know very well, videos by uh, Kelly Jasbach, whom I already mentioned, John McGee, and Arthur Wang, who is the founder of MiniWiz, which is one of the companies that actually uh, is trying to, like, much like the Algae Lab, bring in recycling to everyone. Michael Priceman, who's the CEO of Everlane, Christopher Ober, a great material scientist, and Perk Pineda, who is instead from the American Plastics Association, and actually believes in plastics, and we're going to start with his video. So please run the video. Thank you. Plastics and materials are the future and we're only beginning to see their benefits and that's the macro upside for plastics. And let's keep this in mind if we are concerned about the well-being of every member of society. We need to continue giving consumers choices and that includes manufacturing goods and packaged in different materials including plastics. There isn't a material known to mankind today that is as versatile, cost accessible to manufacturers and consumers and recyclable as plastics. As an economist, I joined the plastics industry recognizing that plastics are far more superior compared to other materials. And this is also the case when it comes to environmental impact. Plastics need to be captured at end use and current concerns of environmental impact of plastics present opportunities which is being addressed through innovation in the entire plastics value chain. I don't think you can say that about a lot of other materials. With plastics, the possibilities really are and have always been limitless. Mm. And now Christopher Ober, our material scientist. Hi, 
My name is Chris Ober, and I'm a professor of material science and engineering at Cornell University. I've been working with polymers, or plastics, for 40 years now, and the positive impact polymers have had on healthcare, food storage, and our overall quality of life has been positive and enormous. Like all people, I'm astonished by the discovery of plastics floated in, floating in concentrated zones in the ocean. Plastics are almost all non-toxic, but any material found in such large volumes out in nature is bound to have an environmental impact. That includes natural materials like paper or wood or plastics made from natural materials. Any solution to the impact of plastics will require all of us, the plastics industry, the user, to play a role. The technology exists for recycling and environmentally degradable plastics, and in most cases, the user is the culprit in polluting the environment. But recycling is not yet simple enough for the average user to know how best to dispose of a material, and industry will have to solve that. The customer will have to commit to paying more for a piece of plastic, and we will all have to commit to these solutions worldwide, since the problem is global. There you go, Chris. Christina, can I please call you to the podium? Thank you. Oh, this is okay, I think. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I think, um, as Paula said, we're, we're here because we're obsessed with plastics, but uh, I am obsessed with bacteria. Uh, I want to introduce you to two species of bacteria that I think will show you a little bit about why I'm obsessed and, and give you a sense of w uh, where I think bacteria will be in the future. Because I think that bacteria and biology more generally shows us a path for how we should rethink design and technology. Because bacteria can do things that we can't even come close to. Uh, Eginga will believe that biology is the most spectacular technology on the planet, um, and that we have a lot to learn from bacteria. Uh, so, so this is Cupria vita snicator. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it, because when I was in grad school, it was called Ralstonia eutropha. Uh, it keeps changing its name. Uh, it's a really, really interesting bacteria. It was first isolated from sludge. It's like pond scum or something, like a pond scum, like swamp bacteria. Um, but it does something that we are dreaming of being able to do with our own technology, which is it captures carbon dioxide out of the air and it turns it into plastic. Uh, it produces PHAs, uh, polyhydroxyalkanoates. Uh, they're natural polymers that they, they produce naturally. Um, they're kinds of plastics that have a lot of different, uh, a lot of different properties. Um, how you, can, you treat the bacteria differently, they'll make different kinds of properties. Um, there's another bacteria. This one is called uh, Idianella sacaiensis. Uh, I also don't know how to pronounce it exactly. It was discovered pretty recently uh, outside of a, of a plastics recycling factory in, uh, in Japan. Um, and what's really special and interesting about this bacteria is that it actually can do the opposite. It's adapted to break down plastics that people thought previously were not biodegradable. So it can take some of the polyethylene terephthalates, the PET PET plastic um, that was being recycled at the uh, at the plant that it was outside of, um, and actually you can break it down and use it as its sole source of carbon. Um, so that's what I think makes bacteria really, really spectacular: this ability to adapt, to evolve, and to be able to do things that were not thought possible before um, because of this power of, of evolution. And so uh, that power of evolution, the, the ability of bacteria to do spectacular things, um, around the same time as people were first discovering and, and uh, developing these plastics, those 1950s, mid-century, we have so many new kinds of chemistries and new materials and new things that chemistry could do, people were also noticing that there were bacteria that were evolving to be able to break down these previously not discovered molecules before. And so they were like, great, we can just throw it all out in nature and bacteria will figure it out. Uh, and they, they called it uh, the principle of microbial infallibility, this idea that bacteria would just figure it out. <laughs> so I have some opinions about this. I'll get to it later. Um, but I think that this is, uh, it's important to think about. And I think it gives, it brings up sort of three important uh, sort of facets and aspects of, of bacteria and plastics that I want to talk about. Uh, one is evolution. Uh, the other is design. And the other is systems. So evolution. 
So the, the principle of microbial infallibility, that's the sort of mid-century way of saying life finds a way. Uh, and, and I think the way that life finds a way is actually particularly interesting. Um, and as a biologist, as a biochemist, it's something that I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And, and, as, and now as a biological designer, wanting to design with biology, understanding how biology designs, how biology evolves is really important for us to be able to figure out new pathways to, to do materials and new ways of degrading things. And so, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, a famous evolutionary biologist, um, he wrote this when he was talking about the, the methods that evolution found used to discover new pathways. Um, so he writes, organisms have no equivalent to currency for acquiring something truly new. They can reconstruct only from their own innards. So what that means is that biology, in, in its evol evolving and evolution, is always upcycling. It's using things that already exist and finding new applications from it, evolving new pathways from what's already there. So the, the bacteria that degrades plastics, um, that enzyme, that can, the, the, the PETase um, that people discovered when they discovered that bacteria, it actually looks a lot like an enzyme that breaks down the waxy surfaces on plants. Um, so the same kinds of things that can sort of chew on long polymers um, evolved slightly different behavior to be able to, to degrade another kind of material. Um, in biology, sometimes we say that this is a, they're promiscuous, which I also kind of have problems with. So I like thinking about said, this idea of upcycling, uh, the sense that you can kind of t take from what's there, draw from that to find new ways when new, new problems arise. And so um, that's really important to us at Ginkgo when we're thinking about design. So Ginkgo Bioworks is an organism design company. Um, we are, that's the other spectacular thing about biology is that it is designable. We can program DNA, we can write it in our labs. Um, this is one of our foundries at Ginkgo where we use automation and software and really brilliant people to design biology. Um, it's kind of like a rapid prototyper for, for microbes. Um, we can use the robots to be able to test many different possibilities. Um, and we actually kind of do it using the same sorts of principles that biology does. We know that biology is smarter than us. <laughs> we know that they have four billion years, you know, microbes have four billion years on us and have probably come up with a solution to the problems that we have. So when we want to find a microbe in a, or an enzyme that can do something, we look to biology first. We do something that we call um, synthetic metagenomics. We look at all of the things that have, have that kind of function, all of the genes that look similar, um, and we, we build them all in our lab and we try to see where, where uh, which one can work with us to do the thing that we want, the, solve the problem that we have, whether it's breaking down plastics, producing new kinds of materials, or, or any other things. Um, and then from what we can learn from the synthetic metagenomics, we can also do design. We can find things about, we can learn more about the specifics of how that enzyme works, the tiny, tiny parts of the enzyme, the folds and the, ch and the twists and turns um, that make the enzyme be able to do what it can do. Um, and so that, that, uh, the enzyme that could break down that waxy substance, they looked and saw like it just opened up a little bit of the fold and now the, pe the pet could go in and it could degrade it. So you, know, you, can, you can understand a little bit more about that structure and you can start being able to design around that to make new kinds of functions in biology, all drawing from what we already know. And so the last thing I want to talk about, though, is systems, right? So you know, maybe microbes will find a way. I do believe that microbes are truly spectacular and able to do so many different things. Um, I do believe that we will be able to evolve those enzymes that degrade bacteria, uh, degrade plastics, to be able to do to degrade them faster, to be able to do it in a way that we relevant to recycling. But we can't do it enough <laughs> to solve the problem that exists because that system is just so, so, so big and so complicated. Um, so when you look and see just how much is out there, I think we can't really fight that. So we have to find a way together. So I'm, I'm really excited to join everyone else on this panel and, and figure out how these tiny, tiny things can become part of a much bigger system. So thank you. Thank you. And now uh, John McGeegan's video, please. Up to 12 million tonnes of plastic waste enters our ocean every year. We've seen through David Attenborough's eyes the incredible consequence this has to our wildlife and to our planet, and it's with utmost urgency that we must deal with this crisis. We've been looking to nature for a solution, and incredibly, in 2016, a Japanese group discovered a bacteria that was living in a plastic recycling dump, eating its way through plastic. 
In our lab here in Portsmouth, we've been analyzing this enzyme and improving it so that we can use it for recycling. The idea is we collect the plastic waste, we add the enzyme, it breaks the plastic into a clear solution of monomers that then we can reuse to make plastic or reuse to make better plastics. This would create a true circular economy. There's a long way to go, but we're hopeful. Roger Griffith. <laughs> you, you, can, you can use that can if I you use want. This, yeah, of course. And, the and you can use a clicker. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. So when Paula invited me to speak here to the, the, this evening, I had a, a little trouble trying to come up with what I wanted to talk about. There's many things in my job as a conservator here at MoMA to, I could talk about one object, I could talk about many objects, but I, I actually thought I should not tell the history of plastics, but a little, bit about, a little bit about it so that we understand that this really comes from nature. And so natural rubber is something that actually comes from nature. Also cellulose acetate, these early plastics that were developed um, for the film industry. And then, as we all know, that um, plastics then became uh, something that artists loved to use, and so did the designers. And so it continued. Um, many of the plastics that were developed after the war were the plastics that were petroleum-based plastics. And these are the plastics that, you know, as, as we've talked about already or you've heard today, um, are things that are in our everyday, every, everything that we touch, everything that we see. Um, but with conservation, it's a little bit different. Um, here's an image of an exhibition that's currently on view. So if you have time, you have one more week to see this show, The Value of Good Design uh, by Juliet Kitchen and Andrew um, Gardner. And if almost every single object in this design show, which a lot of it starts from post-war until um, most of the post-war uh, designs, have some plastic, whether it be an adhesive or a laminate, or um, you, you can think about your own car, how many plastics are in them. And these are some of the challenges that we as conservators are faced you know, to, to take care of these objects, because my job as a conservator is to be the caretaker of these objects. Um, but I wanted to back up a little bit, and Paula's already mentioned this exhibition that she did in uh, 1995. And this was an exhibition that sort of changed the course of my, my career as a conservator. Because in the summer of 95, I was preparing to go to London to study at the Royal College of Art. And my, object, my, my objective was to become a conservator of furniture and objects, basically more of a generalist. But after this exhibition, uh, Mutant Materials, I decided I wanted to focus on modern and contemporary. So I get to the Royal College of Art, and the first two objects that they hand me are these two objects, SACO, which is made of polystyrene, and also polyurethane textile, and then the, uh, this um, blow chair, uh, which is made of PVC. Unfortunately, both of those objects were no longer exhibitable. So I decided to write a very short paper called the, the two um, pooped out pop chairs that were in the Victorian Albert Museum's collection, which had I known this was gonna catapult my career, and it still to this day, people still contact me about this very tiny article. Because these two objects that they handed me, the very first two objects, uh, were no longer exhibitable. They're now in the storage of the Victorian Albert Museum, living in their sort of coffins, as it were, not exhibitable. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a conservator here at MoMA. We are very fortunate to have a beautiful lab that we get to work in here at MoMA. Um, and so I, I wanted to just um, show that these are some of the, again, objects that I deal with every day. And you can just look at this one image, and you can see there's plastics almost in every single object. Um, what is a conservator? What do I do? Well, I'm a caretaker of the collection. So my job here at MoMA is to try to preserve those objects. So a little bit differently from some of the other speakers here tonight, I have a very narrow view. My objective is to keep these objects, to try to keep them and, 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 and make them exhibitable for as long as we possibly can. Um, but one of the ways that or one of the things that's important is we have to understand the material. We have to understand what we're working with. And so matter or materials is something that's very important to us. And that became sort of my focus, as I said, early on. Um, I wanted to just show you very quickly some of the plastics that are in MoMA's collection. Here's a work by Antoine Pevsner, all made out of cellulose acetate and cellulose nitrate. I want you to note that when he chose this, this material, it was because of its sort of transparency. And as you can see, it's now opaque and sort of yellowed. The same with Ava Hess's Repetition 19. Um, this is a glass-reinforced polyester. The same thing. When she made this, they were much more transparent. And some of that degradative, when things degrade, they change in their, their sort of view. And, and that's what's happening here. They're becoming more opaque. 
Um, unlike Matthew Barney, who actually employs a conservator sometimes to help him choose materials. And this particular piece is made from a, a copolymer called um, polycaprolactone, which um, he sometimes uh, refers to it as self-lubricating plastic. Uh, also, our, the helicopter that hangs in the museum is made of acrylic. Uh, we also have Shiro, uh, Shiro Kuramata, who also uses acrylic. And then Japanese textiles also using synthetic textiles. We have a large collection of textiles in the collection, which also have um, um, uh, polymers as well. But as my job, as I told you, as a conservator, I have to take care of these objects. So this is me working on the Rachel White Reed uh, water tower that's on top of the building. Um, a lot of our job is really about maintenance and storage. This is something that we talk a lot about as a conservator. Um, uh, another object that I recently helped restore for the um, uh, Yugoslavian architecture show last year was this uh, K67 kiosk by uh, Sasha Machtig. And so this is a glass reinforced, but in this case it was more about sort of bringing it back as best we can, restoring it so that it looked like it did when it was first made. Uh, another piece that I really adore is a piece that I sort of stumbled upon during some in storage was this uh, prototype that was made as an auditorium chair for the 1939 Godwin Stone Building, which had a mechanical damage where somebody obviously had sat in it, so we decided to do a replacement. And then I, as we're going to talk a little bit more later about these degraded plastics, I just wanted to show one quick image of sort of some of the pieces in MoMA's collection that are degraded beyond their uh, exhibitable, uh, so that it can no longer be exhibited. And uh, on the upper right is a, a pair of goggles that has some polyurethane foam around um, the top. And polyurethane foam is one of those plastics that really doesn't hold up well, and it's something maybe we'll talk a little bit more uh, about in the panel. But I wanted to leave you with um, something that I happened upon while I was on a sabbatical in Japan. Um, there was an art, uh, artist by the name of uh, Jorgen Lail. Um, he had an exhibition at the 21st Century Museum where he uses found plastics. Jorgen was a, was a um, designer who happened to have a place in Okinawa and he started to notice again part of that sort of a swirl of garbage in the Pacific was washing onto the beaches. And he was very sad that you know this was happening. So he decided as a designer to start collecting it. So he started collecting it and making design objects with these found plastics. And so I'm just gonna leave you a little bit with a, a short film before he died that he made just a tiny clip about what he says about um, these things that he's found.人間は何でも壊しちゃうんだから、あの一番大事なもの忘れてるだと思う。で、水も木も全部の自然はもっとだから、それなくなるともう何もないんだから、それは一番大事なものだと思ってるだけ。Thank you. Thank you, Roger. <coughs> so now we have um, Kelly Jazzak's video.
All right, and now we have Marina Zerko. Do you prefer that microphone? Uh, no, I no? think I have okay. to manage. Thank you. Thank you. This is a good follow-up uh, because um, when we were talking about what to take on in our portions of today, uh, I said I wanted to talk about affect, um, how we feel, what we feel, and if we feel plastic. So here goes. In uh, 2012, I completed 10 works exploring petroleum and petrochemicals, including, of course, plastic. Nope. Let's see. Is this supposed to be a video? It is a video. Okay, so video. <laughs> <laughs> Just one minute of it, if you can. Maybe it's yeah, not Yeah, let's see if it starts. Come on, come on, it looks great. Okay. Oh, yes. No. There's a little hand going. Yes. Let's have faith. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Behind the curtain. Hello, folks. I'm a carbon atom. And since I'm an essential part of each of the hydrocarbons and Hello oils, folks, I'm a carbon atom. And since I'm an essential part of each of the hydrocarbons Hello and crude oil, Hello I'm folks, here to give you I'm a carbon atom. Hello folks, I'm an essential part of each of the hydrocarbons and crude oil, I'm a carbon atom. Hello folks, I'm a carbon atom. Hello folks, I'm a carbon Hello folks, I'm a carbon atom. Hello folks, Hello folks, Hello folks, I'm a carbon atom. Can I say cut video, please? <laughs> You're stuck with this now. Oh, <laughs> this is that's the reality of plastic right there. Um, okay, so this was part of uh, 10 pieces that I made, and um, this one was uh, appropriated from a 1947 film called The Real, the Real Modern Story of Gasoline, uh, which was an auto industry promotional. It was a, a small clip that I just replicated until it became claustrophobic. And uh, we can't, I, I'm not taking any responsibility for the... Uh, racial suggestions of these characterizations of carbon and hydrogen atoms, but um, we could certainly talk about that. Um, so the harmonized system, on another note, is the tariff code that governs all things that are legal to import and export. It's 26,000 lines of things and growing. I edited a book by the same name in 2016 in which all of those things were alphabetized instead of categorized. and. Uh, that creates a kind of a concrete poem out of these 26,000 things. And then I invited a dozen artists, writers and artists, to choose a particular line of code and offer a brief commentary. So on this next slide, you'll see sample images, uh, sample pages from the book. Um, and I'll read one of the authors, our very own Heather Davis, who I hope is here. There is no ocean. There is water and salt and microbes and bacteria and container ships and human bodies and fish and plants and car parts and lighters and toothbrushes and persistent organic pollutants and sharks and pesticides and paint and mollusks and coral in aqueous medium. Some of the things dissolve or will dissolve. Some do not. The ones that do not are sometimes called hydrophobes. These are the molecules derived from oil that become your comb or water bottle or tight jeans that make your ass look good. They hate the water. They are not watery beings. And because of that, they will continue to persist for an unspecified period of time that we sometimes call in perpetuity at the bottom of this aqueous medium. So plastic is only one facet of our entanglement with material, the moving firewall of stuff that we extract, make, move, and discard. The Harmonized System book was part of a larger project called More and More, The Invisible Oceans, a project whose intentions included making visible the slithering, unstoppable force of logistics, the global mechanism by which we make and move this firewall of stuff. The installations feature objects that represent uh, major export 
uh, major exports from port nations. These objects are rendered in three different materials. Generic 3D models are 3D printed in standard plastic filament. Then a mold was made from which one version is cast in gypsum. And the third version of the object is cast in mycelium and coffee husks. Each cast further closes a supply chain. And you can see how this mycelium material moves the object from being something standardized and reliable to an idiosyncratic form that's full of liveliness and will. Mycelium was first used uh, as a casting medium by uh, the artist Phil Ross, and then commercialized in early days by Ecovative in the mid-2000s. And now, as you saw in Paola's presentation, lots of people are exploring this for much more than just a styrofoam substitute. Uh, Phil's now working on a leather replacement, a vegan leather. So the, next, the last and next two pieces I'm going to show are highly participatory experiments that ask publics what it's like to be in new relationships with petrochemicals. Immortal Plastics took place for one day as part of the New Museum's Idea City Festival. Sarah Rothberg and I set up an Immortal Plastics assessment service that inspected, itemized, and weighed each participant's clothing and effects. Their belongings were placed uh, on one side of a balancing scale, and in the case of intimate items, weights were used instead. The other side of the scale was filled with an equivalent weight of plastic pellets. So here are some of the results. Participants left with their itemized petrochemical receipt and were offered a jar or jars of the equivalent weight in plastic. As you might imagine, most people declined to take the jars. Landfill Club was an initiative over three months to build a social sculpture with students at Baruch College. A cubicle on each floor of a library got populated over time with plastic waste that was set on cardboard plinths. Ben Kaufman and I held workshops with 150 plus students, creating an open-ended labeling system for the plastic pieces each student brought in. We did Landfill Club again at a literature science and the art conference in Milwaukee, and it worked equally well with theorists. The thing about the students was, when we say we, we really can't say we, because there is still a tremendous disconnect with plastic. And I went back at the end of this three-month period, uh, and many students cursed me for, um, they just couldn't view plastic in the same way, because now they felt like they had actually encountered it. So to wrap up a brief, uh, I'm going to give my last 30 seconds to George Carlin, the really immortal George Carlin. Um, that is the end of the show. So I'm just going to read uh, quickly a uh, video. We couldn't download it, so it's just a great place to leave this. The planet will be here for a long, long, long time after we're gone, and it will cleanse itself, because that's what it does. It's a self-correcting system. The Earth will be renewed, and if it's true that plastic is not degradable, well, the plastic will simply incorporate plastic. The planet will simply incorporate plastic into a new paradigm, the Earth plus plastic. I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, now we go with Arthur Wang's video, please. Okay, hello, my name is Arthur Wang. I'm the founder of uh, this uh, technology company that upcycle trash into a new product called Minimoots. Okay, uh, how do you capitalize on plastic recycling? I think plastic is everywhere. The only way to do it efficiently is by decentralizing recycling everywhere. That's why we created these machines. So now you're in our Singapore office. Um, this is actually using these decentralized machines to be able to take trash and produce what you see, these beautiful ceilings here, okay? And you can take all the leftover uh, ocean plastic waste, mix or ideally sorted, then we can create value by working with local artists and to create beautifully designed product with 3D printed tools. So you can see these portable machines are linked with the 3D printed tools and, and robotic arm. So you can use the latest technology to be able to decentralize the production of trash and localize the creativity. Thank you. <laughs> and now I would like to call to the podium Greg Bookbander, please. Um, boy, it's a pleasure being here today. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my journey and how I got
got into plastic, and it all started with this chair. It's, it's the Navy chair. Uh, the U.S. Navy back in World War II, they needed chairs on ships that were lightweight because ships, everything above the waterline, causes a ship to roll. They needed something fireproof. Any, any fire on a, a ship is lethal. They needed something non-magnetic so it wouldn't affect the instruments. They needed something that would be non-corrosive for the salt air. And, and most importantly, they needed something super strong so the big burly sailors couldn't destroy it. Well, Emico worked with some, some scientists and engineers at the time, and they, they came up with uh, a solution that was so robust and so strong, it, it was used for all warships. I don't know if a film goes on here. Here we have one pristine mint condition Emico Navy chair designed to withstand torpedo blasts. Let's see if it can withstand being hurled at a brick wall, shall we? There we go. After throwing the chair against the wall about 50 times at huge velocity, um, it's still in pristine condition. A few minor scratches here and there. One chair leg minus. But apart from that, still nice. And remember, folks, do try this at home. So why am I interested in something that lasts long? Why am I interested in how did I get into this whole plastic thing? I grew up in Southern California, and um, I spent a lot of time in the ocean. And I've, I've done a lot of sailing. And um, it really concerns me when it rains in Southern California, the flood control channels, or they call them the rivers, they wash into the ocean. And the bacteria level is super high. And it's, it's just not even, it's like, like swimming in a toilet. It's terrible. And you could walk down the beaches and, and they're, they're really bad. Um, in 1998, when I took over Emico, I met a, a designer, Philippe Stark. And I was able to work with Stark and take this military product and he basically washed it and we came up with a chair called the Hudson Chair. The Hudson Chair, first job was the Hudson Hotel right down the street in New York. They ordered a thousand chairs. That was over two decades ago, and there's still a thousand chairs in use that have never broken down. So the whole premise of what Emico is is making products that last. That was the whole thing. And aluminum is such a great material because everything produced, it, there's like 95% of it still in use today. I had an opportunity to work with uh, Coca-Cola. They, uh, they, were, they were very interested in keeping plastic bottles out of, out of landfills, out of the ocean. Plastic bottles, RP, P, PET bottles, are the best way to transport beverages. And I felt like that was, uh, that was a real great problem to work on. It was, it was similar to the problem we had with the Navy that we solved. And we started in 2006, and in 2010, we developed this chair that was strong, that was sturdy. And the whole point of it was to inspire other people to start using this material to keep it out of the landfill. Well, now we are using about 10 million bottles a year making this chair. But now that we've kind of learning about more and more plastics, we're using other materials. Um, so Philippe Stark did another project with us with a different material. 
and this is uh, polypropylene. It's interesting hearing about what polypropylene's been around that long. So there's, there's a lot of it around to, to really upcycle into something usable. But Stark uh, named this chair broom because it's swept off of factory floors. Um, our latest chair is by two designers, Barbara Oscoby in London. Uh, it's interesting because when we were working on the 111 chair with Coca-Cola, it was really a problem. When we first launched it, we had a tremendous amount of rejects. And it was, a, it was really a hassle. And the, the material didn't flow very well. We ran hot oil through the molds so the, the, the molds would flow better. We, we did everything we could, but people would get it. And even though this is made from a recycled material, they didn't want blemishes. They didn't want flaws. And so they would send it back. And, and we, we worked and worked and worked. And we've been working on this material now for 13 years. And we finally have gotten the material to the point where we could actually take one of the flawed chairs, grind it up, and make it into a new chair. So actually, this collection, we've gotten to the point now that it's stronger than any other chair we made. And Jay and Ed, Barbara Oscoby, they really worked with us closely. They worked with us to use the least amount of material. And every time they would do a, a design alteration to use less material, we'd run an FEA to see how strong it was. And we went back and forth and back and forth. And the result is a chair that is just a really great sustainable chair that we can now, it could go out in the world, and hopefully it doesn't have to be recycled, but it can. It can be recycled again and again and again. And we've gotten the material to that point. So it's been a real interesting story, and, and we're just uh, launched it this year. I think there's a film. Or do I have to? Oh. So this is one of our testers. So again, everything we do is from our history, from the aluminum chair. We try to make everything. And to us, the most important thing we could do with any plastic we use is to give it the longest life possible. Thank you. When we first walked into our factories eight years ago, the thing that was so obvious was that every single product that came out was covered in plastic. And it's then that we realized that as companies, we can have a huge impact on the overall plastic supply chain, both from doing the right thing and then influencing our customers. So from that end, I really believe that every company has to do its part and look across all of its production and usage and figure out ways to reduce. The number one thing we can do is say no to plastic. The number two thing we can do is, for all the plastic that we use, make a commitment to remove virgin plastic from the supply chain. We made that commitment last year to remove 100% of all virgin plastic by 2021 in all the apparel we make, the bags, everything. And I'm happy to say that just nine months in, we're 50% of the way there. So it is easily achievable, you just have to commit. And I think everybody owes that to the planet. And I would like to call Mark Chambers, please. Which microphone? Uh, I'll stand over here. My cup is going to slide down, so I'm going to try to get it to stay there, too. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you guys. Uh, I think that part of my job is just to do that and to kind of demystify a lot of the, the, the work that our city has to do in, in, in aggregate. So let me start. My name is Mark Chambers. I am the Director of Sustainability for your great American sanctuary city that is New York. Um, and in that capacity, it's my job to um, 
to paint a very clear picture of what New York needs to be in the next five years, 10 years, 50 years in terms of our relationship to our home planet. Um, and it's also my responsibility to, to use policies, to use programs, to be able to um, give us guide points and kind of like a guiding light at each step along the way. It's also my job to ask a lot of questions. Uh, and in particular, as it relates to this conversation tonight, uh, there's a question that we have to ask ourselves about, you know, our relationship to waste. You know, how do we change that? How do we move away from this notion of planned obsolescence? Uh, I think a lot about the fact that we, you know, everything from the, you know, the cell phones in our pockets, the, uh, the glasses on our face, the, you know, the clothes that we wear, uh, they're often designed to be used once or used very infrequently and then thrown away and kind of giving us this, uh, this false illusion that that is an option for us. And of course, in a city of 8.6 million people, uh, it's really the scale that matters. You know, I meant when uh, Christina was talking earlier about the fact that you know, these you know, this bac bacteria and these you know, small organisms have such a large potential, but the scale of the challenge is so dramatic and so daunting that we need systemic change in order to be able to truly address this. I'll, let me give you an example of scale. So each one of you in here, you're responsible for about, I don't know, about 750 pounds of, um, of trash a year, right? So in aggregate, back to the 8.6 million people of the city, that's about 10 billion uh, pounds of plastic bags each year that you guys are responsible for. Uh, it's about 36 million pounds of plastic cutlery, those single-use plastics that we, we talk about often. Uh, in a city like this, that ultimately ends up with us being able to uh, account for over 150 million um, uh, pieces, like small pieces of plastic that end up in our waterways. Uh, 618 million plastic bottles per year are, are used in the city. Um, about 77% of those end up in the trash. So it's a daunting scale for what we're, our challenge, and there's a, there's a common denominator for, the, for what's happening here. 99% of the plastics that we're dealing with in New York City are derived from fossil fuels. So it's not, it's, and the idea that when we looked before at some of the presentations about the changing from you know, non-oil-based plastics into plastics, it didn't happen by accident. Uh, that was a very intentional decision to be able to move us systemically away from alternate options and into a system in which we would be more and more reliant on fossil fuels. You know, that convenience has a consequence. And for us, it's important to be able to unpack that consequence every single day and come up with solutions that all of you can benefit from. So what I wanted to kind of just talk about today is just, again, these kind of governing ideas and, ha and give you an insight into how I think about it and how I think about the problem solving uh, that's really at stake for us. Um, and one of the biggest things that it's important for me to kind of demystify is the idea that we can just take on one part of these challenges alone and not address some of the other components that really connect with it. A, a lot of you have, uh, you know, you'll hear conversations, you know, whether it's nationally or locally about people pursuing the Green New Deal and looking at different aspects. And, but there's an important part of it. The important part of that conversation is that we are moving to a place where we know that each and every one of you has to bend your skill sets, your, your artistry, your, your, uh, your work kind of ethic towards working on the climate crisis. That's a given. You're going to have to bend it in some way. Uh, so we know everyone has to work on, this, on the climate crisis. The question is, can everyone work on the climate crisis? And so one of the challenges and one of the things that we focus on is being able to unpack that. So one of the biggest parts that we also have to take on is the social infrastructure that allows all of New Yorkers to be able to actually contribute and take part in this great generational challenge that is um, uh, facing um, us and facing our species. Uh, so three, three ways in which you can kind of think about climate actions a little bit differently. And this is the way in which I often talk to large groups about this is uh, universal pre-kindergarten. A lot of people don't think about that as a climate challenge. But the fact that we are moving in a place where three-year-olds and four-year-olds all throughout our city, by a matter of right, can have access to, uh, to young um, uh, early education means there's a lifetime of learning that's going to happen with that. And we're going to need them in 20 years when the true impacts of a dramatically changing climate are something that we hopefully will have made strides on. But otherwise, we're going to need them to be effective and uh, large contributors to, uh, to our city and to uh, our response. Looking at 
again, universal health care for New York City? How do we kind of address the fact that like 600,000 New Yorkers don't have health care insurance? You know, being able to effectively create the connection between your ability to thrive as a New Yorker and your ability to contribute to this challenge is, is incredibly important. Last one on the social infrastructure that I'll mention is, again, doesn't seem like a, like a climate uh, impact or a climate strategy, but IDNYC. The fact that if you are 10 years old or older in New York City, regardless of your documentation status, you can get an identification. An ID that gives you access to museums, libraries, an ID that gives you access to, to being able to work, to being able to access to, to other healthcare. Those are the things that make you a New Yorker, and we need everybody on this. Behavior change also becomes a really critical aspect of how we are able to move people forward. We have a large program in New York City called Green NYC. It's our behavior program and how we kind of push information to all of you uh, about different day-to-day -day things that you can change to be able to contribute more. And not just about recycling, but about some of the values that you actually need to take to be able to make those decisions. Recently, we launched a huge program called Bring It. And many of you may be familiar with it, maybe, maybe not, but we did a partnership with uh, Swell Water Bottles. Uh, and last fall, we handed out a reusable water bottle to every single New York City public high school student, all at once. We did it in like three days. It was incredible. Uh, so 320,000 reusable water bottles were handed out to every single New York City public high school student. And what it does is that it doesn't just say that here's a thing that you get and you can kind of have, a, you know, have fun with it. It sets off a, a pattern of behavior. You know, if those young New Yorkers, soon to be voting New Yorkers, if they take that on and they kind of move through their adult lives, being able to reuse water bottles, not taking on single use plastics, that's 54 million water bottles, plastic water bottles that get displaced from entering our landfills, entering our water stream. You know, this is, this is the type of systemic change that we have to think about in, in the ability to kind of leverage all of our creative power as well as the private sector to be able to achieve. Um, we talked a little bit about um, the role before of, uh, again, big, big changes here and, and where we can find ways to, to, to help all of you. One of the, the biggest ways to help is, is through laws and to making sure that we are actually taking all the values that were expressed in everything we talked about tonight and actually putting them into effect. That's why in January 1 of this year, um, it you know, uh, single-use uh, styrofoam was banned in New York City. That's why last month, um, finally after two years of, of kind of work with the state, plastic bags are banned in New York City. Uh, that's why we also announced an executive order in which now New York City, and I was talking to a few uh, folks about this earlier, um, through our city government, through hospitals, through schools, and through jails, where the largest amount of kind of single-use products are used for, for food distribution, uh, we announced an executive order. We're going to phase all those out. Um, within 120 days from that, that order, each of those big entities are going to be um, developing plans that will systematically get rid of, of single-use plastics throughout uh, city government. And so it's, it's part of those large efforts that don't just give an example for all of you, but it also responds to the demands that a lot of you have made, and it gives examples to other cities. So part of what we have to do is de-risk this work for other cities to make sure that they can effectively move us uh, forward collectively. And lastly, uh, back to the notion of, um, of the fossil fuel industry and how a big impact it is, it's important that we also kind of go to the source of this and demand accountability. And so one of the other things that we've been focusing on and actively doing is divesting all of our pension funds that are related to fossil fuels out of um, these fossil fuel companies that have been systematically um, forcing us to have this, this, um, this addiction uh, that uh, manifests itself in our, our relationship to, to these disposable plastics. Uh, we're also been suing those, those companies to make sure that we can effectively, again, move them out of the decisions that our city is making. And the last thing that we're doing is taking on another kind of tactic around uh, extended producer responsibility. And that's just making sure that producers of materials that use these plastics embed within the products and the value structure of their businesses, their organizations, their products, the ability for those to be taken back, recycled, and, and put back into the, the value chain and, and into the, um, uh, the circular kind of economy of those products. It's important that we shift away from all of you just having your individual responsibilities to making sure that we are holding large entities accountable and making sure that they are no longer giving us 
products that we, that we can't recycle. Like we can no longer make things that we cannot unmake. And I think that's something that fundamentally we're trying to shift on your behalf so that as New Yorkers we can set an example and as New Yorkers we can make sure that we are uh, changing and moving towards a future that is truly our only hope. And so I'm happy to be able to join you guys tonight and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So I, I would like to invite you all to come and sit with me. I'm going to sit here. You all sit wherever you want. You have nice glass bottles of water <laughs> there with you. Uh, this is my seat. I'm going to stay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. I'm going to stay here. And also, I would like to greet also those of you that are in the overflow room. You can send, you can send me questions. My email is paola, with the O, underscore, with the P-A-O-L-A, -A, yeah, underscore Antonelli at moma.org. And if you send me questions, I'll ask them for you. What a wonderful tapestry of different um, outlooks and uh, relationships with plastic we've had here. It's really quite amazing. But before I start asking other questions, I would like to ask Mark something. We talked about education, we talked about changing behavior, we talked about legislation, but the big question is, what do we recycle when we recycle? You know, what's the truth about recycling? Because I think many New Yorkers wonder. So. The I think you start talking All and right, then no, they, go on. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. So the truth is that, especially, I mean, this is a regional kind of question, right? In New York, for the most part, every plastic that you have and will use in your day to day is recyclable here. You know, we have the ability to be able to collect and take it to our Sims facilities and be able to, for the most part, separate them and um, and recycle them. The one of the biggest problems, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, is uh, where it comes to some of the. Uh, the disposable plastics that we use on a regular basis, the small ones, the, the forks, the straws, the little pieces that we don't give a lot of consideration to, uh, they're just so small that they often fall through the, the systems that we have, the large machinery that we have to, to capture recyclables. So they don't end up getting captured in the way in which uh, we need. That in addition to the fact that people don't often put them in the right place. And so uh, part of what we are, are kind of committed to is, is acknowledging that, yes, the systems are in place. Yes, we functionally can take every one of the plastics that you'll use in your day-to-day -day and recycle them. But getting them from your use into a facility and, and being recycled, it requires a larger effort that is not just about individual responsibility. Got there it. has to be something bigger. Mm -mm. Thank you. That explains it. Um, Christina, biopolymers, how, we're all looking at them as like the hope for the future, and biopolymers is such a gigantic also category of polymers. Um, what do you see as the most promising ones when you see something like the algae platform, and they said you have 3D printing vessels or objects with algae, which ones do you think will have more, more legs? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure I want to answer that question because oh. I don't know if I have a favorite. I love them all equally. But I think, uh, but maybe what's actually more important, I think, or, or more challenging about bioplastics is actually it's the systems problem that Mark is talking about. Uh, so, yeah. and, 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 not, and not just systems and all of the pieces there, but also like the, yeah, the big institutions, the companies, right? So when, when we're, we're thinking about bioplastics and polymers and we have all these bacteria, they're so good at doing their thing. And you talk to companies and they're like, no, thank you. That's not gonna like uh, yeah. that doesn't perform up to my standards. Uh, so actually, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, from uh, from Greg, yeah, from Greg, like what your opinion is on biopolymers because yeah, everyone I talk to is like I don't know, no, it's not gonna do the performance. So like maybe if you can figure that out. But so I think it does. It's gonna take a lot of different changes yeah. throughout the whole supply chain. So I think you know I, I, all of them are so interesting and and they have interesting properties and they have different different sort of systems that they're thinking about. So like, yeah, is it gonna be something that everyone's gonna make themselves from the algae that they can collect? Or is it gonna be something that's gonna be bigger, right? Like each of them it, it has a different future that they, that they imagine, but all of them require systemic changes. But it, it seems like uh, the idea of decentralization was, you know, like letting people do things at home, both recycling and making biopolymers. But you were about to say something, so please. You were, you were about to. Well, yes. it, part of the challenge we have is the, the consumers and for them to value what we're doing because yeah. so often they're, 
they're they've they undervalue because they feel like okay this chair came from waste it probably isn't as strong or it costs us more money to do that it costs us more money for tooling it costs us more money for our R&D the material itself costs us more money than the virgin material what what's not even in this equation is when you buy a chair that only lasts a year and it goes into a landfill they don't equate that as a cost. That external cost isn't, isn't added to it. And that's something that as educators, we have to really, and, and I love what you were saying about the, the young kids, because that's the future. When they understand about external costs, we have hope. There's also the concept of embodied energy, which is a concept that I learned from David Benjamin, who's the architect that actually did the hi-fi, you know, that the construction at Yap. The embodied energy is like thinking of anything from, well, it's for buildings usually, but it could be also the shoes, starting from the very, very, very source, and therefore taking a more systemic approach to all the resources on Earth. But going back to that idea of decentralization, which is quite fascinating. I mean, as an artist, um, you're used to making things, Marina, and um, it seems like both David Wang from MiniWiz and also the designer from the Academy in Eindhoven were trying to push this idea of having almost domestic recycling centers. Um, how does that, what does that make you think? I'm sure it must excite something in your mind. Sure. Well, I, well, if it doesn't, it, you yeah. cannot say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't lie. Um, sure. I, for you know, it's a really interesting to be in the middle of this Venn diagram of interests, from the very large scale to the very tiny and intimate. And I really appreciated what Christina said. That everybody, I think you had said, said that we all need to participate in this variety of scales. And I don't know, but I think home. It's not the Jetsons yet. Right? It's not mm -hmm. the Jetsons cartoon where we just pop something in and a, a new pair of flip-flops comes out. And I actually think that the promise of endlessly renewable newness is one of the big paradigms that has to change, mm -hmm. is that we can't keep thinking that we can pop something in and we can quickly remake it into whatever we want to have today. I mean, it's just, these are, the, when you get to the home scale and the individual scale, I, I think we have to, see some opportunities to retool our minds around these relationships. And that has to do with how long things last as your company is doing and um, how we really connect the dots about impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and time really is uh, quite an issue. I mean, both Roger and Greg look at the long time of plastics from, for different reasons. So um, when we did the Triennale in Milan, we were trying to push this idea of restorative design, and we saw there are many different strategies, and one of the strategies is to keep something for a really, really long time, right? So the opposite of consuming. So um, I find it really fascinating that you've been trying to deal with plastics that lasts for a very long time, because you're almost denying what plastic was supposed to be at the very beginning. Well, I don't know. I, I, isn't that the problem with plastic yeah. in the oceans? It just doesn't mm -hmm. go away. But maybe that's a good thing for us. If it just doesn't go away and we could put it into something that's usable, that never has to go back in the ocean, yeah. then it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And Roger, what about you? Well, I think it's, uh, I have a different problem as, as a conservator here because, as, as I said, you know, my job is to make these things last. And there's so many, there's so much research into putting plastics in cold storage or trying to, you know, uh, make them last longer. I don't know if that's the answer either, and I was talking to Christina about this before the talk. You know, the, a lot of these plastics, some of them are going to, to we're going to lose them uh, as art objects, especially like the early plastics that are more made from more organic natural materials and we just have to accept their death as well and it's something that well it's hard <laughs> we were talking about it before there's this chair that i love the gunnar agar anderson chair 1964 this blob of self-skinning for urethane that is just like falling apart um and uh and roger tells me died 
you know, it's no, died not out. Yet. Not yet. And not I'm yet. like, oh, maybe some <laughs> nanobots in the future, <laughs> you know, can actually, bring it back. Actually, it's not so bad because it's the interior of that one is polyurethane and it's embrittled. But as long as nobody touches it, <laughs> you know, as long as nobody sits in it, it's going to be okay, you know. But um, it's difficult. It's a difficult challenge for us, too, as conservators. And also in our profession, we're starting to, you know, we use a lot of, of adhesives that are based on polymers. So a lot of the work that we actually apply to the artwork is also a polymer, like a lot of the, uh, the uh, synthetic adhesives. And that also what we use, we are like doctors where we put, nitrile rubber gloves on and they're one use we throw them in the garbage you know and we're trying to change that in our profession and also within the institution to start recycling those plastics as well so even within our pro profession you know a little bit like the medical industry we have a lot of stuff that just goes in the garbage which is something we have to change i would like also to address how beautiful plastics can be it's very you know we we talked about toxicity and the problem etc but there are, especially in the 1960s, when designers, companies were enthusiastically thinking of plastics as the materials of the future, there have been moments of uh, pure delight with plastics that are not very easy to achieve with other materials. Um, especially you as a manufacturer working with designers, how do you see the expression, the visual expression of plastics in the future? Because so many of the chairs that you did with recycled plastics were version of aluminum chairs or version of something else. You know, one thing we have realized is we can do all the work and all the research and, and do something really great, but if it's not beautiful, people don't buy it. And ultimately, to pay for the tooling and the research, we have to ultimately sell some of the products. So what we found is when a product like this, this last product we just did with, with Jay and Ed, it, it, it stacks in a rotational way. And it looks like a piece of sculpture when they're all stacked up. It's just absolutely a beautiful piece. And people stop and they look at it and they, they love to look at it. And the other thing that, that they did that they bring to the work we're doing from a, a science and engineering standpoint, from a, a visual standpoint, they're thinking of ways for people to really love the product so they want to keep it. They're talking about the product in terms of, you know, we're, we're talking about a circular material. They're talking about circular stacking, a circular shape. They call it on and on for, and they, they, they create some romance around this, this product and it really, it makes it come alive. Yeah, that's very important because, you know, if you want to change behaviors, sometimes elegance, formal intention, beauty, they're means of communication, they're forms of respect. So maybe it's also the non-disposability of plastics because of the effort that the designer has put in it that can do something to make it last longer. There are so many different bits and pieces and um, in the audience we have so many people that are really close to this issue. So I can't see you at all. Maybe I can have a little more uh, light on the audience. But do, does anybody want to start asking questions or, oh, great, or making statements? For instance, I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, wait, wait a second, Anwar. I'm, they're going to bring you a microphone. I, oh, 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 OK. First, OK, first you start, and then we go to Anwar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, so for, for me, because as you've already pointed out, everyone in this audi audience were chomping at the bit with, uh, with what to do about plastics and how to live our lives a little bit better um, for the planet's sake. And I, I don't think the problem is with art. I think the problem is with plastic bottles. And I'm wondering, and this is maybe more of a government question, um, can we, do you think we can ever get to that day where we can stop selling beverages in plastic bottles? Short answer is yes. Um, but I, yes! <laughs> but, 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 I, but I will say this, though, and I, I, and I, don't, I don't know if I stress the point enough, is, is that um, you can't do it alone. Like, I mean, I think that the notion that all, the notion that the, the Pacific garbage patch is your individual fault is, is a trap. 
right? It's like, yes, you guys should be recycling, you should be effectively making these decisions because that's the right thing to do and you guys can, we all live in a society together and we should be making the right decisions about how we, uh, we live our lives. But these large systemic problems, you know, a lot of the, the decisions were decided for you before you got the product. And so for us and for all of you, it's important to not fall into that trap of just thinking it's just because you're failing that this, this, is, this is happening. It's like you need to hold people accountable. And so the people yeah. that are making these products are the ones that are uh, going to be a key in making sure that when you go to buy that drink, the options don't include that plastic bottle. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I want to thank you for this. Um, event. It's, it's really brilliant in my opinion. It uh, brings together a lot of dimensions. But I'm wondering why I feel more depressed than when I came in. <laughs> and yeah, I think well, we're I, I, the word that we heard most often here is we. But the biggest we is missing, which is the firms who make profits from pushing these things. If you have a chair that's indestructible, you must not think that people will hold it. Our iPhones could last 10 or 15 years we turn them over every couple of years because we're pushed to do that. Um, I watch Rachel Maddow, I confess, and it's 20 minutes of Rachel and 40 minutes of ads. At least it feels like that. And it's terrible, but unless we can stop the push, I don't think we'll be able to do anything. And so uh, we need to talk about that big we, which is profit making from all of these things. Yeah, I'm an so economist, Greg, by the way. So Yeah, no, thank you. I'm a, so, Greg, what is, um, y clearly, if people are going to keep your chairs for a longer time, you'll sell less. So, what's your business model? I mean, I know that you are, I know that you have, you're a very ethical person. So, <laughs> it's like. Yeah. Well, my wife said, she came up with a slogan for Emma, go, sell a chair, lose a customer. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, there, there is something to that, and, and, and really, the, the reality is, in our industry, very, very, very few people go down our path. It is not, it's not a path for profit. It, it, takes, it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of cost, um, and it's, it's, it's just, our purpose is to try to, try to try to do the very best we can. So. Um, we do, and all of us, you know, we, we go to our stand and we sell chairs and we have our own recycled bottles that we, we don't drink out of plastic bottles even though we use them for our chairs. Hopefully we run out of plastic bottles at some, some time and we can't make more of these chairs, um, but we, we sincerely care. So I have, um, can I ha I, I'm going to ask a question from the overflow room. It's actually for Christina. And uh, um, in Angela Mariani wants to know, are there any of your materials that are already in use since you say that it's difficult to get companies to adopt them? Is there anything that's already in use? There are lots of bioplastics that are, that are in use. Um, uh, there, there's like the cups they made out of corn. I think uh, there's, there's things that are sort of like, are just, yeah, they're just like another kind of disposable thing. So I think there's like problems with that <laughs> for mm -hmm. many reasons. And then they're also like not recyclable. They, they have to go in a different stream. Um, so that's another piece too. Like they, they actually mess up the recycling. So if you, if you accidentally put a compostable like PHA based plastic oh. in the, tr in the recycling bin, it actually like gunks up the plastic that's there. Oh. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different kinds of, you know, there are things that are out there. They're n yeah, not things that I've been directly involved in, but Lots of people I know who have done that. So, uh, but yeah, these materials, they're, they're out there. They're usually more expensive. Um, they have these other kinds of issues that, that make it really hard for them to kind of reach the, because yeah, if we're trying to replace and replicate a system that's made based on petroleum, uh, it doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. um, and I so see. That's, that, that's why I keep kind so of So it's about changing the yeah. system completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. There's here and there. So you're already on that side, and then we'll come back to you, Tess. Oh, no, we'll go to, we'll go to Tess now. OK, perfect. And then Wendy. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, my question is for all of you. I think the biggest thread that I've seen throughout each of your presentations is, is, an, is an intimacy with matter, whether it's on an artistic level, through government, through 
um, through commerce, through art. Um, so I was just wondering, it seems like it, this requires an ideological shift in the way that we relate to objects. And I was wondering how each of you, you know, if you could talk a little bit about how that might look like for us uh, as a species to, 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 to just treat our objects better, maybe. Not even just plastics, but in general. I love this question. Go ahead. Mm -mm. Who wants to start? Roger, no. you can start. No? No, no, no. Wait, no. I can, uh, you start, Marina. No, because no, this is like, start. well, I, 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 I don't want to use consumer consumption consume anymore. I think that we should embrace, adopt, marry objects. You know, it's just, I, I feel more comfortable with things than with people. So that's, <laughs> Marina, on to you. <laughs> I love that. Obje object is sexuality, yeah. right? I, I, well, yeah. oh my God, that you is You marry like, the Eiffel Tower. That and is you, such a yeah. weird thing. Yeah. Yep. And then um, Annie <laughs> yeah. Sprinkle has been, we met, she's been, she and her wife marry the earth over and over. They married mud, yeah. they married rocks. Yeah. I mean, this is, of course, I'm on the outside fringe, right, in terms of my, uh, putting forward a kind of ideological gambit. And I, I but I, I kind of want to protect the man who said he came in more depressed mm -hmm. and say, you know, the, the, the problem is the, the single bottom line in corporations. That is the number one problem. We can't talk about plastic in isolation or paradigm shifts because we're stuck in accelerated necessities to make profit. And there's no time for companies to do R&D or to sort of delight in like liveliness or anything like that. So yes, intimacy is the personal practice that gets you to go to the voting booth. Intimacy is the thing that helps you teach your kids to love stuff and te teach my students to love stuff who are adults. You know, we are not a we who are all champing at the bit to get rid of plastic. There are lots of people who are like, not don't have the time, the space, the money, the luxury, the knowledge to understand to connect those dots. So we have to do that. I actually, I'm, less depressed after this than yeah. I was before, so maybe, yeah. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I don't know, hearing people, like, who are, are pushing for this change in life and working to, to do things differently, like building businesses with different models, like building legislation and policy, like building, yeah, new ways of, of interacting, like, that, that to me is very inspiring. Um, and I even like the question of, like, uh, like, thinking about our objects differently, right? So, Actually, I think you mentioned sort of the, the disposable plastic. There's a guy in the 50s who was like, the future of plastic is in the trash. Yeah. And that was like an inspiring thing that he said to like the plastics consortium conference because it was like, great, we're going to make so much plastic. It's going to all go right in the garbage right away. And so like, yeah, if you, re if you just reframe that, like what if plastic was precious, right? What if it was something that you, yeah, you spent money on because it was beautiful and you wanted to keep it forever? You know, so yeah, I think right now, yeah, I feel icky and I feel bad anytime I, you know, I am in a situation where I need to use something that's disposable because that's the only option, <laughs> right? And and I feel I have a guilt. Uh, so like, what if it was instead of a guilt, like I had a treasured water bottle, right? Like something that that I don't know. That that feels to me like an inspiring question, one that we could collectively think about for the future. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, it is about education as well. I think Mark talks about this as well, and everyone here at this panel realizes that we do have to educate ourselves and the public. Um, uh, on a side, I, you know, I was going to ask Mark about uh, who else does he look at in other large cities around the world to sort of get ideas, because I, I did the sabbatical in Japan for six months, and I was amazed how good they were at recycling. You know, they they, get, they handed me the first, th in the, the apartment building, a 12-page front and back document on how to recycle my garbage. <laughs> and I didn't do it very Ooh. well for the first few weeks. And if you don't do it well, you get fined, you know? And, you're, and, and, they, and, and it was funny because they kept saying, well, we know it was the Gaijin in the building who didn't do it. Yeah, right. I know, the Gaijin, you know, it's like, anyway. You know, and it's like, I didn't read it very well, and I didn't educate myself well enough. And, and you know, I, I actually had to turn to people to help me, you know? And, it, and, and eventually I got there, but it, it, you know, I had 12, I think it was like tw six or 12 um, containers in my kitchen to divide up the plastics because the lid was separate from the from the bottle the plastic that's around the bottle was separate from the bottle you know everything had to be divided it was amazing you know it was really amazing no, absolutely i think that's it's clear and, and especially you'll see in a lot of 
European countries, particularly, I was in Helsinki about a week and a half ago, and they have, I think, nine different bins that they use. Uh, and the more bins is usually more evidence of the fact that more laws have been put in place, you know, the, and, and there's more accountability. And so it's not just about finding people that, that do it incorrectly. There's that as well, because that's also important to kind of curb behavior. But it's also making sure that whatever you have can be broken up into these particular things. And that had to come from a place where there was a policy in place to say that here's the rules you're working with. There's and actually, no I, have a I have a question for you from Abigail Simon that actually is exactly about that. She says, the question of confusion came up, and I find myself even more confused. You said that all the plastic is recyclable, but this seems not to be generally known. Plus, the city has decreased recycling pickup in many neighborhoods. How is that consistent? Right. So yeah. uh, there's, there's two parts to this. So there hasn't been a decrease in recycling pickup. Um, what there all has been is also actually an increase in organics pickup. So many of you might have also seen that uh, mm -hmm. a lot of you um, now have co uh, the ability to, um, to have collection for food waste. So whether it's like an actual brown bin in front of your, your home or your apartment building or something at a farmer's market within the, the, the region. And so it's uh, part of recognizing how the distribution of waste matters in terms of greenhouse gas emissions means that the same recycling is continued, but in addition to that, we've layered on more services to make sure that we're getting at the food waste, which is what's really contributing the largest part towards greenhouse uh. gas emissions. So it's, and it's, I, I make no excuses for the uh, communication. We are not good at talking about things we're doing, like in general. Um, we try a lot, but yeah, most of you guys don't pay attention to what we're saying, and it, it's, not, it's not your fault either. Um, but, but I do agree that there is a part of this where we, we have the ability to get out of our own way, and we have the ability to take all the kind of things we're talking about and make sure that we're meeting people where they are. The, you know, I mentioned before we did this partnership with Swell Water Bottles to do the, um, the, the handout. I mean, part of that is because they're beautiful bottles. I mean, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not just because we wanted, you know, to be able to get people to use reusable bottles. Beauty does matter. You know, oh, I'm, yeah. I, I'm an architect, and so, like, I want things to be uh, beautiful by definition. But there's a part of this where how you reach consumers, how you reach people, has to acknowledge what we're attracted to because it has to get over the hump of convenience because right now that's the currency that most people make every decision on is the yeah. fact that I need it to happen right now and like I need to go somewhere, you have to come to this spot and get me, you know, and, um, and that convenience currency is something that um, the only <laughs> way we're able to shift that is through systemic kind of, I think, laws and policies and to be honest, like, making it attractive and beautiful. I'm kind of fixated on this eight bins. <laughs> and I think, no, I think it would be wonderful if a company could use recycled plastic to make eight bins for all the New Yorkers. Um, uh, there are actually, they, I, we had, I, OK. But I, I, afterwards, there's okay. a lady here, and then Piero. I'm a depressed in an opposite way. I don't know what's wrong with the bottom line. People work very hard, and it kills innovation. I don't think so much regulation is really good, and I think freedom is where it's at. S and education. First education, then freedom to Definitely. go about it. So there's um, here, and then Piero, and then back. I mean, it? I just want to say that even if every water bottle just evaporated after use, it would still, uh, producing it mm -hmm. creates a huge environmental impact, you know? The, so the production of certain throwaway things should just already be curbed, even if they're made out of de easily degradable materials. That's one thing. The other thing is, like, a few years ago, I uh, had an Apple desktop computer, which is not solely made out of plastic, but to a large degree. And uh, it was declared after five years of huge use a vintage object that had died. And I said to Apple, would you please take it then? And they said, no. And yeah. I think this is a gigantic problem. I had to find a way to get rid of this monster. Mm -hmm. And I think <laughs> there should be some kind of responsibility from companies to take back their trash. Yeah, and that happens, and that happens in they parts of the world. They did not at the store. Yes, okay. they did not at the store. 
Okay. <laughs> anyway. But, yeah, but a lot, a lot. maybe they, uh, they do, or maybe it's a few yeah. years ago that okay. this happened. Okay, order, 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 the, order. <laughs> Mark, yeah. you want to say th I, something? I think, I think your point is correct. I yeah. think that there are some entities because that take things back, yeah. not as many as they yeah. should, um, and I, do, I don't think they're going to do it unless they're forced to do it. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, so, I mean, yeah, uh, of course. That's it. Can, <laughs> of course. I want yeah, actually, can I add something to the oh, lady yeah. who left? Because sure, I sure, think sure. it's relevant, because I think um, I recently, like, again, it's like a framing question and a framing thing. So I, I recently heard about, so like, Americans often talk about freedom as in freedom to, like, oh, we should be free to do whatever we want. Uh, whereas people in many other places in the world think about it as a freedom from, like, we should be free from the pressure of plastic leaching chemicals into the water that we are drinking, right? We should be free from the things that are causing climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, so it's just a different kind of way of thinking about freedom, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, you t <laughs> Yeah. Piero. <laughs> so uh, I take a little 30 seconds first to clean a little bit the table for my attitude. I'm not against the profit in general, all these things. I'm not a radical communist, but I passed through this. I saw the Triennale. You remember, Paola, before your uh, exhibition, there was an exhibition about Achille Castiglioni and what he was doing with the Montecatini, the big chemical Italian company at the time. So all of us came from a show in your presentation for the idealistic idea the plastic was making everything more affordable and distributing comfort and, 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 and goods to people that, that couldn't, couldn't pay for that. I made with uh, Achille Castiglioni some pieces that you remember, you were still in the studio when we did it. And with Philip Stark, you remember the, the iconic small lamp that I did in plastic with him. In. So I, I had to explain that the person that's speaking uh, is Piero Gandini, who used to be the CEO of Floss. That's a, a lighting company. And so that started at the time of the plastic boom. So yeah, when, when I did uh, Mrs. in Plastic, my idea was this, was, oh, a company was known for beautiful pieces, very expensive. Now we have a product available for, for everybody. It was very inexpensive. And we redid it six years ago with bacteria. We, with a company called BioOn, and now it uh, became a public company using the bacteria coming from the scratch of sugar. We, we, we develop with them the capacity and we sponsor them to arrive to reproduce that, plastic, that lamp in bacteriological uh, plastic. So it was smelling to the name of the company? Bio On. Cool. And it's a very interesting company. And it was smelling too sweet, the product and the <laughs> colors. And it was not great, but it was the beginning. So it's always the customer. So and yeah. I, want, I, I make this introduction was to say all of us are part of this. Now, we all came from this idea that we have to distribute more and do things. But the problem is numbers, as an entrepreneur, a little bit out of my, uh, of my mind. I guess the recycling, correct me if I'm wrong, is taking a very small part of it. Yeah, I thank mean, you. every That's every awesome. year, okay, every year, I don't know many billions of tons of virgin new chemical plastic materials coming from oil are reversed into the market through different ways, products and other ways. So I, I, I really appreciate here what we what we are trying to to share, but in reality, it looks to me like that we are using a spoon mm -hmm. to take out the water for something is coming from a fall. So yeah. definitely, I think that in Everything is important, but at the end, we have to stop this fall coming down mm -hmm. somehow. Take out the health. Okay, health care is very important. They can do things that without plastic you cannot achieve. Okay, let's keep going on with them. But we have somehow to create in a political way that we have to share, yeah. but then we have to do something. Not because they are the evil of the profit. We are all part of that. But because simply, or is an emergency, and if it's an emergency, we have to stop it. If it's not an emergency, at the end, why are we talking? So what do you all think about this? Do you wanna, who yeah. wants to take this on? Uh, sure, I mean, I'll, again, Go Mark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, Go Mark. I, I think that you're right, I d and I also feel as though uh, the power that we have to be able to uh, exert that value is not just with our individual purchasing, right? So um, uh, every, a lot of these corporations, especially like large ones that are responsible for a lot of the products we buy, a lot of them have uh, what we call um, CSR, corporate social responsibility. So it's basically they are now in the values game of here's what we're about as a company. You buy into the brand because here's what we're about. And they put that on their website. You can see like what their kind of value structure are. That also opens them up to engagement with all of you. 
you don't have to wait for the ballot. You can, you can get online, <laughs> and many of you have the ability to directly engage with um, these entities in a way in which we haven't had for generations before. So I, I would just say that like, look for power and look for where you have the ability to exert your power, uh, and it's not just in your decision to buy something. It's that too, but it's also you're going to have to be activists, and there's no way around this, because if you're waiting for this to change on its own or waiting for your single you know, reusable bottle or bag to be the thing that makes a difference, we will not be able to make this happen. Like You're going to have to hold people accountable, and you're going to have to activate yourself as part of that challenge. Um, now, oh? Oh, you wanted to also add Joyce, Joyce over here, and then a... Just want to make a statement. Uh-oh, a statement. Yeah. You need a microphone right. for the statement. When I was first married in 1949, I'm an old lady, I had a Frigidaire Frigidaire, the first one that was uh, able to be defrosted. And it would break down, and the man would come to my house, and he'd say, don't ever get rid of this one. I had it for 40 years. Yep. I now had, I had a sub-zero, very mm. special. Maybe it lasted eight years or less. Mm. I have a GE monogram. So it's what's ready the statement? To go. The, the statement used to be made is better. we need more government in our life and more rules and less obsolescence. In other words, I've lived Yay. through obsolescence. <laughs> And I want to go back to where it was a little bit. And I'm not <laughs> Yay. saying Yay. There you go. <laughs> Thank and you. And I think maybe we just have to vote for the right people. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. I, uh, may I ask, for, I want to take advantage for a moment because um, also, sorry, Heather, I'm going to put the spotlight on you for a moment. Oof. So Heather Davis, um, I, she was mentioned quite a few times in your bibliography. I hope you've done all the readings. And she collaborates a lot with Marina and Heather is one of, the, one of the writers that has written most beautifully and poetically about plastics, even while talk, talking about its toxicity. So I wanted to know more about the relationship, you know, how you work together, Marina and Heather, because um, I think that uh, the kind of getting under the skin that writing and art can do to change behavior is really powerful. So can you say a little more about how you work together? Um, that's a good question. I can't, I think, we were asking last night actually how we first met each other, or I guess two nights ago, um, and I think it was through a mutual friend who also works on questions of plastic and does plastic composting on a domestic scale, um, which with mixed results, um, and uh, because you have to um, make sure that the worms don't pupate, um, and like regular composting, um, but um, I think like, you know, I, I think I originally ran across your Petroleum Manga project, um, which for those people in the audience who are interested is a beautiful and incredibly important project that, um, that really illustrates the ways in which a kind of chemical literacy that we often don't actually have. Um, so one of the things I think that, that's a problem with, with plastics is that we think of them as a generic term that's, a, that's just a large, um, like one entity, but actually they're not. There's incredibly significant differences between various types of plastics, right? PVC is incredibly toxic and we should really stop using it and manufacturing it because it leads to all kinds of cancers and we've known this since the 1970s. Polyethylene, on the other hand, is relatively benign um, under certain conditions. So, uh, so you know, it, like the amazing thing about what Marina's project does is that it really illustrates this um, beautifully in terms of all of the kinds of, in terms of a kind of visual literacy that we don't normally have. Like, how many of us in this room can identify what is made of PVC versus polyethylene, right? Um, mm -hmm. Even, I mean, I've been studying plastics for the past eight years and I still can't identify things off off the top of my head often. Um, so I think that there's like, you know, I've, I've really gr had a lot of inspiration from Marina's projects and we've collaborated a lot over the years. Um, and also just, I guess, somebody, a, a, somebody who, a co-conspirator who likes to think about uh, what plastics can be otherwise or how to uh, think about them circulating in the world as both um, productive and uh, destructive. I also very much like, um, and I'm going to get, in the meantime, you can give the microphone up there. I re very much liked also what you wrote about 3D printing. We haven't talked about it tonight, but 3D printed has uh, kind of re-injected the magic into plastics yeah. and created you know, this new 
flourishing that is that can be quite dangerous in case beautiful essay. Or, uh, or, oh, you or, want no, just to add a great phrase that Yuna Chowdhury came up with, which was the plastipocalypse. Oh yeah, which <laughs> I think now the 3D printer promises to bring more of that to our lives, as much as it's bringing domestic freedom to make more things. But we have to really think about matter and materials. Mm -hmm. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all. It was fascinating. Uh, the comment just made about the different types of plastics, which was made earlier by Paolo when your first complicated slide, makes me wonder the lack of knowledge, of course. It's, it's, could we have a precedent in the no smoking campaigns? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a big, I, I know propaganda is criticized as not being effective anymore because we're all in our own private Idaho's. And if propaganda comes from one source and not another, we don't listen to it. But on the other hand, when you think about the no smoking campaign, it didn't seem to break down along, maybe it did, it certainly broke down socially. But I think it was, a, is there, are there, Mark, are there propaganda or um, educational tools that could use the wit of say, which I can't believe no one's mentioned, the graduate, remember when Dustin Hoffman- Oh, somebody had to mention <laughs> it. I had to, yes. Gosh. I'm that old. But no, I'm serious, you know. So can we get away for two hours without talking about that? Yeah, really, but, but to, it's, humor is a great way to ease people's anxiety. Yes, this is depressing, but a certain amount of wit, and as, as along with pictures of your lungs with plastic in it, I'm just saying. Oh my yeah. God, you remember that, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, I think there is like, there feels like it's a difference. There's, there's something like, maybe it's my, my own filter bubble, but like it does feel like there's a qualitative difference in the way that people are talking about the ecological crisis, the climate crisis. Like the, there is something, like people are, they're more activists. There's people in, literally in the street now every day like fighting about this. I think. There's been a, a shift. Uh, I, I feel. Do other people notice? Have anyone yeah. else noticed? Okay. Of course. So I think that that, that to me means something. And I'm, I, I, so I did say, I did say I've talked to companies that are like, oh, I don't want your, your crappy plastic. That changed like two weeks ago, where I was like, well, I talked to one company, they're like, the CEO now says sustainability matters because like our, yeah. our 18 year old yeah. customers on Instagram are talking about how they care, uh, right? Like, true. so I, I think it, like, that does trickle up. That does make a difference. I, that ground. Yeah, that grassroots is it matters. Uh, so yeah, it's working. <laughs> um, I, I think I, I think oh. there are, and I think it's important to be able to find uh, to find that. I also think that it it, it may be uh, something in which um, the private some of the some of the folks that are doing good work now need to be pushed to do better work. You know, so I mean, I think that as opposed to saying, I mean, I would argue that with the 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 largest uh, reductions we saw in smoking, particularly in like, kind of like juvenile smoking, a lot of different things came about with the increase in taxes towards yeah. smoking, right? Yeah. So like, it cost more to buy a pack of cigarettes, less people were buying them, yeah. right? And so, um, but I do think that the ability to look at who is actually um, having really strong creative voices out there, and you can tell because they're impassioned and they're connecting with you as a consumer, those are the same types of folks that you need to kind of push to be involved in the other parts of their decision tree. So they need to, they, they can't just be um, you know, kind of alongside you for the, the ride of one part of their product, they should be alongside you for, for the rest of it, and you need to hold them accountable for that. So I have um, one last question coming from the plush overflow room. And it's from Michelle Lee Johnson, and it's quite beautiful. Uh, it's for Mark. In New York City, there are quite a number of people, primarily immigrants, who sustain themselves by collecting plastic bottles and taking them to recycling centers. There are communities in the States, Flint, Michigan, that survive from plastic water bottles since their tap water is polluted. When we address the systemic problem of plastic through elimination, how can we also account for those who do depend on it where it is not mere convenience? It's, it's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about root problems here. And so like the larger question around both environmental justice and in terms of climate justice has a lot to do with the reason I talked about social infrastructure before, it's because it underpins our ability to actually take this challenge seriously. It, it's, you know, recycling and using the, the kind of the, the economy that goes along with, um, with taking bottles and kind of like getting the, um, the, um, the five cent recycle for them or, or, or so forth, that is 
one way in which to kind of like participate in, in, this, uh, in, in this economy. It's not the only way. It is an outlier of a system that we have just decided to accept. It's like, so it, it's not that we should protect the ability for people to recycle plastic bottles. We should protect the ability for people to have jobs that can support their families, that they can participate in this, in this in economy. And so it's not, it, it has nothing, it's, it's like the plastic is not, not the problem. And I mean, the plastic is not the, 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 uh, the critical part of that. The critical part is that are we going to be a place that recognizes that if you are part of this city, we should make it possible for you to actually live in the place that you work and make it possible for you to actually afford to do so and afford to be able to contribute. And that comes along with education, it comes along with job opportunities, and it comes along with us looking at the social things that inter underpin how we're able to stay in this amazing city and be a part of it. We don't want, I mean, I, I look at San Francisco a lot, and I'm not trying to like demonize San Francisco, but, uh, yeah, the, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> I mean, Please. you know, there's Police. a there's a lot there's a lot around <laughs> what what has happened to that city in terms of not looking at the the underpinning of social infrastructure and how it has gotten away from them. And they're doing a lot of amazing things now to try to like get that back. But it's you you know you want a city that has um, as rich and as diverse a population as New York City, where everyone is contributing in a lot of different ways, and you have to protect that. And part of that means making sure that you're you're paying attention and putting the attention where it deserves. Well, there you go. Complexity is our friend. And uh, no, really, I mean, it's a, it's a complex issue, and we're all really dealing with it. And that's the best that we can do, just cut, come together and talk as adults or as kids. But I would like to really, really thank you for this wonderful evening. I would like to thank you all. And um, just. Um, a few small announcements. As usual, there's mediocre wine and so-so snacks and great conversation outside. MoMA will close next week, so you have a few days to uh, finish watching your shows. It's closing on June 15th, and then we're going to reopen on October 21st. We're going to come back bigger, stronger, faster. We might have a salon in between, but we'll, we'll let you know. And let's meet outside. Thank you so much. <laughs>